Good evening, ladies and gents, and welcome to this webinar looking at two of our master's courses from the University of Hull. Um, my name's Simon. Um, I'll introduce myself more in a moment. Just, just as we get started, let me first introduce the director of the Energy and Environment Institute, Professor Dan Parsons. Thanks, Simon, and uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's webinar. Um, I'm Dan Parsons, as Simon said, I, I direct the Energy and Environment Institute here at the university, and that's a structure at the university level that brings together all the disciplines uh, that are needed really to address big global challenge areas, such as a transition to a low carbon future and, and everything that's needed in and around uh, renewable energy in order to facilitate that but also um, how we do that in, in a way that is um, a, a exploring or looking after our, our natural environment and, and our managing our natural environment in terms of, of uh, the, the services it provides, but also the way in which it's, it, it symbiotically links back to us as, a, as, as societies living in those environments. So the two master's programmes that you'll, you'll hear about today are really the, the flagship programmes across this energy and environment space at the university and the idea of the master's programs are to give you a really solid footing in these areas um, for future career um, opportunities in particular so they've been co-designed with with, um, with with practitioners um, working with with partners um, so in in the region such as Orsted and Siemens um, and, and, and others um, and on the environmental change and management and monitoring side working with partners such as the Environment Agency um, the Scottish Environment Protection Agency etc as well so so you really get a practical basis um, within within these 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 areas also linked um, incredibly well through to the theoretical underpinnings as well so it's very much um, about that kind of longer term vocational practical um, driven side um, so, so this evening, uh, um, you know, thanks for joining us. But this, this evening, you'll you'll hear about those programs. You'll hear you'll hear from one of our, one of our, um, our our alumni um, from 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 these programs, and 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 hear about what it's like to be a postgraduate taught masters um, student at the University of Hull as well. Um, so, with, without any further ado, I'll pass back to um, Simon and, and Magnus, who'll who'll go through the programs, give you all of the details, and I'll be around at the end to. To, to, to uh, join in and answer any any questions uh, you may have. So um, enjoy the ride and I'll see you on the other side. Thanks, Dan. Um, so just before we get started any further, this is gonna be a slightly interactive event. Um, we're gonna have a uh, survey for you in a few slides time. So to help you get ready for it, pull out your phone or fire up another browser window, go to menti.com and when you get there, type in this code, two four nine seven three eight six one and i've got that code listed on the next couple of slides so you can do that while we're introducing ourselves so introductions wise uh my name is simon waldman um i'm the director of our program in renewable energy which is in the energy and environment institute uh co-hosting today is magnus johnson uh who is the my uh, my counterpart on the and environmental change management and monitoring is it that way around or That's is it right monitoring right. and management i have to think about it myself <laughs> <laughs> um, That's which is actually sure. not at the energy and environment institute but we work really closely together because these things are really closely linked and also joining us this evening to answer some of your questions and try to reassure you that uh, we know what we're talking about we have ellie who is one of our current students on ecmm um the basic outline of the day of the evening is will give you an overview of why you might want to study for an MSc in one of those two topics, and then go into a bit of depth about the two courses and talk about each of the modules that make them up. Uh, finish off with why would you want to do that here in particular? Why is Hull the place to study these things? And then finally, and probably the most important thing is for you to ask us questions. And those questions can be about the content of the course. They can be about practicalities, about admissions. But they could also be about what it was like to live in Hull. What is it like to be a student at the university? And Eddie will definitely help us answer those as well. And there could even be more general ones about energy if you like, and we'll try and get some answers for you. Uh, without further ado, going back to this, I'm going to pass over to Magnus, whose, uh, whose survey this is. <laughs> 
<clears throat> okay. Um, are you going to show the screen for that? Or yes, I need to show the screen. That's a very good point. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so it's a simple survey. You, you, and I, I don't want you to think about it too much. Um, I just want you to have a think. Uh, uh, about these, there's eight issues that are in here. You can see ocean plastics, rising seas, non-renewable resource use, extreme weather, ecological disruption, forest and plant life, famine and food scarcity, and water supply. And I just want you to put those in what you think, uh, off the top of your head, is the order of uh, of importance. Uh, I'm going to do it as well. So, uh, just while well, the answers are coming in, something I forgot to mention on the last screen is how to ask questions. Um, please don't use the chat because we probably won't see it. Um, but if in the interface on the right hand side of the screen, and you might have to click the little tiny orange arrow to make it appear, um, you should find a place where you can ask questions. Um, and if you submit them there, then they'll go into a list and at the end of the event, uh, Maria will read them out to us. If, if it's a really specific technical question about feel or something, she might just answer you in text. But if it's of more general interest, she will ask us at the end. This is good. I'll wait till we get a few more responses. So, so have a go. No, we can't tell who's answering the questions. Uh, and there is no um, right and wrong answer here. We have difference of opinion, even amongst ourselves. Oh, we lost screen. Yeah. About that, the screen should be right back. Yeah. Any more? I think that's probably about it, I think. But oh, another one. Okay, so um, arguably you could say all of these issues are important. Um, uh, it's always interesting to see, it's different every time actually. I, I try to remember what we had last time as a top issue, but um, I'm quite pleased to see that um, ocean and plastics is quite low down on the list. Uh, to me, that's one of it is an important issue, plastics, uh, plastic pollution in the ocean. But it's it's what it's kind of vogue at the moment, uh, and I think sometimes in science, fashion um, becomes more important than the actual meat of the the substance. And I, I would agree with uh, that probably the, the the top two there. Extreme weather is is becoming a real issue, and ecological disruption is the sort of thread that runs through all everything that ecologists think about. Um, Simon may disagree. I mean, what would you put as number one, Simon? You're asking me to think about this. <laughs> I might actually put ecological disruption and food scarcity, which I think are, are closely linked above yes. extreme weather, but they're definitely one to three. Yeah, uh, and it's interesting as well. So we we tend to give a particular view we have a particular view of what real problems are and water supply comes out quite low i had a student a couple of years ago from iran and her view was that water supply was a real massive issue because they're having real problems getting hold of um getting hold of fresh water and uh, and she she didn't understand our concern about plastics really uh, didn't put it in the same place as as water at all um although she would agree on things like extreme weather so Really, the, the point of putting this up is to give you a, a, a kind of a taste of what it's like to be a postgraduate student, because one of the things that we'll do throughout the course, and especially one of the modules in the first semester, is we'll, we have open discussions about um, environmental issues. And there is no right answer. You know, what, well, there are some broad answers that make sense, you know, use less stuff eat less meat, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, there are there is no single single solution to the environmental problem. Um, so thank you for answer, taking but no right answers. For those, yes. those who are particularly worried about extreme weather, you might also be interested in our MSc in flood risk management. Oh, we yeah. had a webinar about last night, but you can probably find it on YouTube. Anyway, moving on. Nice segue. <laughs> ah, this is your list, Magnus. Is Anything it? you want to say about that, or should I carry on? All right. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so in it, uh, well, so these are these are issues that 
we had from students uh, previously, I think in, in last year's course. And you can see a lot of these things turn up. Some of the things on here aren't on, on my list for Menti, so like acidification is a, is a real issue. Really interesting issue at the moment because there's apparently been some high level fraud in the investigation of responses of fish to acidification, which has made all the, the international press. And that's another thing that you learn the further on you go in your education, you get to master's level, you start questioning everything. Um, even what um, old people like me say, you know, you, you think actually that might not be, he might be, he might be biased, you know, might be talking rubbish. Um, but, you know, so overconsumption, I think, is one that I possibly should have had on that previous list. I think that's a real massive issue that we all have. You know, we we drive and we don't, don't need to. We eat more than we need to. We eat the wrong sorts of food. Um, we fly around the world, or we used to, once upon a time, we used to fly around the world, go to conferences on environmental issues or climate change, or which is kind of ironic. You know, so um, these are all issues that are challenging the world at the moment and we need people who understand these issues not just to go and investigate those issues as as isolated things but to go into industry with a knowledge of you know these are issues that industry needs to think about and lots of companies big companies now are starting to get much more concerned about their environmental footprint and everybody's starting to think actually what we need to do we need to have a broad foot and to tread lightly across the world and 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 you see that starting to appear um, again and again in international business. So on my side, why might you want to study renewable energy? Uh, you probably have some idea of that if you're here, but I'm going to give you two reasons that you might want to. Um, one is a matter of greenhouse gases. What you're seeing here is a breakdown from 2019 using government statistics of which parts of activity in Britain produce greenhouse gases. And 25% of our greenhouse gases come from electricity generation. 33% are from transport, so that's the energy involved in the fuels going into trucks and cars and buses and planes and ships. 20% are from businesses and public buildings, which uh, is mostly going to consist of heating and cooling them because it's stuff that's not electricity. 18% from homes, which again is mostly going to be heating. We've added up about 95% here. There's, there's, there's some stuff down here which is not energy related, industrial processes and agriculture, but about 95% of UK greenhouse gas emissions are, by, are from energy. And that's less worldwide. Um, it depends how you measure it, but worldwide it's somewhere between 60 and 80%. So our climate problem is largely an energy problem. And that's one reason you might want to study renewable energy. A second more pragmatic reason is about jobs. Um, this is again from government statistics, this plot. This is showing the growth of renewable energy, sorry, renewable electricity generation uh, 2000 to 2017. And you can see here how onshore wind in the really pale color exploded quite early and offshore wind has grown a lot. And solar PV more recently has started growing and offshore wind in particular is still growing at a very rapid rate. Um, and that's brought us up to about 37% of our electricity coming from renewables last year. Not last year, we're not 2020 anymore, in 2019. Um, and that's a remarkable story because uh, back down in, uh, even in 2010, it was about 5%. It's been a really massive increase and that's a success story, but there's still a very long way to go. Um, and at the moment, we're going to carry on growing we're going to carry on growing this at an increasing rate and that means demand for people people who understand energy um, at the moment the renewable energy industry employs about 30,000 people in the uk the offshore wind sector alone has said they need another 17,000 before 2030 and uh, this diagram comes from national grid report a couple of years ago who said that they reckon to reach net zero by 2050 as we've committed to it's going to need uh, 400,000 new people by 2050, but 100,000 new energy workers by 2030. Now, I don't know if that's going to happen. I don't know if we're going to hit net zero when we want to, but if we even try, then we're going to need a lot of people to understand energy. So this is another reason you might want to study it. And briefly, what kind of jobs are there in energy? Um, we all think of engineers and we think of wind turbine technicians, but this is this is taken from a website called uh, Faces of Wind Energy, which is designed to show the diversity. And just looking at some of these, we've got a health and safety coordinator. Um, it's reading the small text that you probably can't read. Uh, design assurance and quality engineer, 
uh, apprentice technician. We've got a project manager here, but not for a wind company, but from a trucking company that specializes in moving wind turbine blades. We've got mariners, design team leaders, business coordinator, uh, civil engineer, training coordinator, procurement assistant. So almost every role you could think of in any large industry, you will find within renewables. Um, the people directly involved are shown there. You've got many, many other supporting. We've got environmental consultants, we've got people doing resource assessment, legal, commercial, marketing, sales, finance, communications, etc., etc., etc. Now. We're not about to make you a specialist in any one of those things. You're not, not gonna drop into one of those jobs without training, which is why the companies usually provide training. But the idea of this program is that we give you the broad knowledge of renewable energy and of the industry to help you be more employable. Um, the idea is that the engineers understand what goes into an environmental impact assessment and the finance people understand what the engineers are talking about. We, we, if nothing else, we give you the language so you can have, actually have a sensible conversation with all these different disciplines and appreciate what they're trying to do. And of course, many of these roles are, are equally open to ECMM people, as well as renewable energy graduates, if they wish to cross to this side. Uh, I think Magnus has a similar uh, set of pictures for ECMM. Yeah. Okay, so these are real students. These are from two years ago now. Um, I'm just, just trying to remember, Simon, do you have a, that picture of Amina? Later on, with the quote. Yes, I'll do that later on. All yeah. right. Okay. So yeah. All right. So, um, but just to reiterate what uh, Simon, because I, I think she makes a really important point that we'll come back to. But um, uh, just to reiterate what Simon's say, saying, really, we we try to give you a broad range of knowledge and skills. You know, so the skills go from things like um, data analysis, how handling massive data sets and dealing with them, presenting them, doing some sort of analysis on them. Uh, geographic information systems and applying that in a range of scenarios. These are both skills. If you look at in, you look at any job in environmental sciences now, um, they're quite often these are some of the things that employers are looking for. They want you to be able to deal with numbers and they want you to be able to deal with GIS kind of things. And they're the sort of thing that makes an employer go, "Ooh, that's interesting. We'll have a look at that that person." Uh, we also, you know, we're also doing a lot of stuff on soft skills. You know, we, we one thing we hear from employers again and again and again is that we need people to be able to work in teams and to work with people from uh, broad ranges of, of, of disciplines. And so we implement that. That sometimes, sometimes students don't like that because they want to be judged on their own merits. But you know, in the real world, I've got to work with Simon. My God, you know. <laughs> so, but in the real world, you've got to work with a range of different people. And so we try to give you. Um, that experience and I don't mean work as in you know behind a bar in Tesco's but at a high level at an academic level putting reports together sharing expertise giving presentations together and all the rest of it so, but we'll come back to that as we talk through the modules so these are a range of students and you can see the range of jobs that they've got there they're not just restricted to environmental sciences a lot of the skills that you pick up during a master's you can apply to anywhere else you know um, in, in lots of other jobs but at a graduate level and you you're giving yourself that one step up advantage uh, above somebody who's just coming out of university with a, with a degree. I quite often think it's a bit like giving yourself an extra uh, band. So if you came out with a two one, it's like having a first. You know, if you came out with a first, it's like having an extra first. You know, so um, it's a it's a really a, a good way to make yourself more attractive to industry. And uh, I've got a similar similar thing here, but without the nice pictures and without the real students. But um, this is some of the uh, yeah, mine's not as polished, I'm sorry. This is some of the ways places that our radio blend your graduates have gone on to, and I won't read that out to you because you can read it for yourself. But there's diversity there. It's not all people working for energy companies, though there are some of those. Uh, you've got the person doing GIS uh, with the Canadian government. You've got people working in consultancies, um, and of course, a wide variety of other things. <clears throat> so let's have a look at the shape of the course. Uh, we divide the year at Hull into three trimesters. Uh, so trimester one is September to about January, trimester two from January through to about the end of May, and trimester three is the summer from beginning of June until the end, at the end of August. Um, and what we have is two trimesters in, in each of which you will do three taught modules, and then the third trimester you do your dissertation. And I think the dissertation, I don't, think, I don't think we'll talk about it later, but well, we will come back to that in a little bit later. Um, now, this may look slightly confusing because there are more than three modules in the two first two trimesters, 
that's because we're talking about two different programs. So the, the key here is if it is in green, it's on the renewable energy course. If it's in dark blue, it's on ECMM. And if it's in light blue, it's on both. Um, we have about uh, half of our teaching shared between the two. And the reason this is really good is that these two topics, renewable energy and ECMM, are really intrinsically linked. Um, the whole reason we're doing renewable energy is for environmental benefit. Otherwise, we'd carry on burning coal for another 100 years. Um, and any time we're building any renewable energy development, it is going to have environmental impacts. Uh, so we need to be able to understand these and predict them and manage them. And similarly, if you are uh, studying ecology and looking at environmental change, that's probably related to a development or a project of some sort. And increasingly, the odds are that might be energy related. Um, so by bringing these pe people from different backgrounds, both within each program and between them, we really get a lot of benefit, as Magnus was saying, especially in the group work, people who have different perspectives being able to work together. And this is a quote um, which Magnus was re referring to from a student on renewable energy a couple of years ago who came from an engineering background, but had this comment that she was able to work with biologists, electrical engineers, environmental scientists, and able to get different perspectives that she didn't get during her undergrad when she was working with lots of people who were studying the same thing. It's, fun, it's something that we've been developing at university recently and talking about is uh, communities of practice. They do it in the NHS all the time. You get a doctor, a nurse, a psychologist, something like that. Well, in, increasingly in complicated projects, mm. well, not increasingly, it's always been that way in, in complicated projects or big projects, you have people from different disciplines all contributing and you need to be able to find ways to take advantage of those people and and understand maybe where they're coming from because they might have a different angle or problem than you do. So it's really good to get that experience at master's level. Very much so. Um, so what we're going to do now is talk about each module very briefly. Um, so we'll, we'll mention each time which program or programs it applies to. Starting off with principles of renewable energy. This is semester one, renewable energy. Um, the aim here, we do two things. First of all, we do a little bit of background um, about general characteristics of renewables and a bit about uh, understanding how we can measure and how we look at countries' national scale energy choices and understanding the energy situation of a country and looking a little bit about how that influences policy uh, at a very large scale. But then the bulk of the module is taking each of the energy sources we look at so wind, wave, uh, solar, tidal, um, geothermal, I think, hydro, biomass. And for each one of these, we'll give you uh, an introduction to how they work and to the physics behind them. Um, usually an overview of the main design decisions that go into building one of these things. And a high level look at how the resource assessment is done. So how you might uh, estimate how much energy is available from this technology at a given location. Uh, moving on to research issues in environmental management and renewable energy, which wins the award for longest title. Do you want to talk about this one, Magnus? Yeah, I love this module. Uh, it's uh, my it's absolute my absolute favourite. So it's in the first semester. People are just starting to get to know each other. Um, and it was a godsend this year with COVID, you know, because we had to do everything online. But we got people working together from both both modules. And basically, um, we look for a set of challenges that are, that are coming our way and we give those challenges to students and say right we want to talk about this so the, the pictures in here represent um desalination which was one thing we got students to talk about and that was a combination of ecology students of so ecmm students and renewable energy students there's an invasive tick that's causing problems i think it's in south america ellie will correct me if i'm wrong um there's a with people talking about deep sea mining uh and the problems that you know the, the ethics of that should we be mining the deep sea is it actually a good thing to be doing or not um circular economy and 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 it, it was a brilliant module because the presentation so we basically do i think you, the first two presentations you do you just get criticized on um nicely we don't do it horribly but you, you know we we give you advice on how to improve on your your presentation and then the second two you're marked on and um, the present, the standard presentation, honestly, was as good as anything I've seen at a conference generally. Uh, I wasn't were, lying when I said that. Um, when I said to the groups, when Eddie was there, I guess, that by the fourth presentation, I thought every single group was better than at least half the presentations at most conferences. 
there was a massive improvement. Um, some people were good at the start, of course, but not everyone. But this is a really good learning process. I should mention, because I think Magnus must have provided the, the pictures of this slide, there are some topics that are about energy as well. Um, we we yeah, do offer yeah. a mixture, and most of the topics are designed to try and cross over both to an extent as well. That what about ticks had some really disgusting pictures. It was horrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, should we should we should move on? Environmental and energy data literacy. Uh, do you want to talk about this one, Ellie? <laughs> Your favourite <laughs> module. <laughs> so this is my module. Uh, uh, it's my other favourite module. Um, and it's where, and I always start it off by saying I'm neither a statistician nor a programmer, but I can do this. So this is, uh, this is all about statistics and presenting data. And we basically have an exercise every week a little short exercise, although students tend to go overboard with it and they tend to do a lot of work and it means I spend a lot of time assessing uh, the work that's handed in on a weekly basis. And um, I found it, work really, it works really well because you're, come, you're revisiting stuff every week and I learn stuff from the things that students do using, it's a program called R, Statistical Language, uh, and that's, that might sound a bit scary to those of you that are more on maybe on the art side or philosophy side or our teachers thinking about coming to do the masters, don't be scared. Um, we have a music teacher that did the um, course with us this year, and he absolutely loved uh, this module, loved R, and he did really well at it. So uh, he he got the he got the hang of statistical analysis. Lots of help. There's lots of help online available. I'm always willing to um, try and help solve uh, problems with syntax and coding and. Um, it's a real skill to be able to brag about when you go out into the workplace or when you, every biologist in the world nowadays pretty much uses R uh, as, as their tool for analyzing data because it's just so effective and you get fantastic, you can produce fantastic graphics. Uh, yeah. I, I would add to that that um, gaining a skill of knowing a programming language is really valuable in itself because even if the job you end up doing doesn't use R, if you find yourself using some kind of programming language, and many scientific jobs will, once you've learned one, it's much, much easier to learn another. Um, well, it, and the other thing is it's free. So R is a language, you can look it up. If you Google R statistics, you'll be able to find a page where you can download the program and you can start playing with it. Uh, and because it's free, it means you walk into an, to an employer and you can say, I don't need to use your expensive SPSS program package. I can do this in R, and I can train the rest of your staff to do the same thing. That may or may not be a good idea, depending on the employer. Um, saying, hi, I'm new, I know better. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, both, both programs do this module, um, Energy and ECMM. Um, but the next one is just ECMM. This is Environmental Change in the Anthropocene. Uh, I don't know an awful lot about this module. Um, so I've asked Ellie if she'll help me. Uh, in fact, you can help me with the next the next couple, really, for all of our, the next few ECMM modules. Um, so yeah, this one is just, uh, again, as mentioned earlier, it's a, it's a broad coverage of the topics that kind of cover this theme. So you cover biodiversity, ecotoxicology, food security, and ocean acidification. Sorry, my children are just bursting in. Um, <laughs> which kind of covers all aspects of the Anthropocene. Um, Hello. So we have, uh, you have guest lectures that are experts in each of the topics come in and give um, lectures and then you do workshops, work together and have assignments associated with each of these themes. But it's really good, broad coverage again, and it's really nice to, if you're not sure where you want to go with a degree or what you want to do, if you're something you're really interested in, as I was with ecotoxicology, that's where my dissertation is now leading. So it kind of gives you insights to different things that you've maybe never come across before. Brilliant. Uh, uh, you probably could give us a bit of wisdom here, Ellie, because I know you've got kids, obviously, and a life outside university. How have you managed to balance? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> how have you managed to balance your university work with with everything else? Um, I think actually the benefit of COVID for me was that everything's been online and everything is really accessible um and kind of a bit more flexibility with the university as well everything's recorded so you can catch up if you ever miss anything um obviously it's still important to attend as and when you can um but it is it's i think life's a balancing act isn't it i think yeah, um, it is, uh... it's hard at, it's been hard at times um but yeah it's just um juggling 
Struggling children is probably the most yeah, difficult, yeah. but if anyone's got a part-time job or anything like that, it's, um, I think it's a valuable skill to take forward with you, to be honest. Um, late night, yes, lots of yeah. coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hang around. You probably probably about, um, yeah. Sorry, Marcus. Go on. I was just saying, Ellie, hang around because it probably helped me with the next two modules as well. We should, we should probably talk a bit about um, COVID and, and how teaching is going to look next year, as much as we know anything. Um, but let's do that after we've been through the other, the other, the other, the other modules. Okay. Um, moving, so that was that was semester one. So we've got two shared modules in semester one, and then one that's unique to each program. Uh, semester two, going back to renewable energy only for a couple of modules. Low carbon energy solutions is kind of the counterpart to principles of renewable energy. In the principles, was telling you everything about the actual renewable energy technologies. How does wind work? How does solar work? Etc. Low carbon energy solutions is trying to cover everything else that's going to affect a renewable energy development. So things like how do we maintain it, especially for offshore, that can be really important to the economics. Um, some of the spatial stuff around where are we going to put it, uh, the, how it interacts with the national grid and how that can affect things, uh, how government subsidies and government support and project finance might work. Um, looking a little bit about at things like storage and integration of different systems. Building design, probably building design. Um, the guy who has taught that the last couple of years is actually just, just left the university. Uh, we will probably have something in there about the downstream energy solutions in buildings, around buildings, and energy efficiency and that sort of thing. But whether it will be exactly building design or something else along those lines, I can't tell you for sure right now. Um, running in parallel with that, oh, okay, I have another graphic there, and I'm not really sure why I have another graphic there, but there is a nice picture of some of the offshore wind zones uh, for rounds three and four. Running in parallel with that, we have another module called Applied Renewable Energy. And this is quite an unusual one, but it can be summarized as getting you as much contact with the real world as possible. And we do this through, well, not this, not this last year, but normally we do it through site visits. Uh, we visit wind farm, a solar farm, usually a large biomass power station, and one or two other things. Uh, the bottom right there is visiting a community energy hydro scheme. Um, we have some practicals, you get to play with some wind turbines and solar panels and so forth. Um, but the heart of this module is guest speakers. In place of the normal lectures, every week we have someone else coming, uh, mostly from industry, but also from regulators, community energy, and one or two researchers in the university doing relevant things. So we're trying to get you to talking to the people who are doing this in the real world and finding out about how this happens, uh, how this happens in the real world, how things go wrong and that sort of thing. Um, there's also usually some other stuff in there like getting tutorials on some industry standard software that varies a little bit from year to year, um, but it's quite good to have in your CV. Uh, next module is a shared one, uh, environmental impact assessment and spatial data. Are you able to speak to that, Magnus, or is that one for Ellie? I think Ellie used it differently, but it's, it's, but it's EIA, Environmental Impact Assessment, is something everybody needs to know in a world where we're building things and developing things, and, and there's a process that you have to go through. Uh, whenever you build an offshore wind farm or a house or or, or just about anything, you, you've got to go through this this thing here. And we, we bring in um, uh, an, an expert in voles and otters uh, to come and talk students through a kind of ecological assessment, which is part of an environmental impact assessment. And usually we have a site visit. We're still hoping to have a site visit. Uh, this year we were, we were a bit restricted because of COVID, but we'll talk about the COVID stuff later. Anything you want to add to that one? Yeah, Ellie? there was also, so this is split into two sections. So we do cover the, obviously, the environmental impact assessment as well, but you also do a, se a section of GIS. Um, which is really good because I'd never done this before and as you mentioned earlier it's a really good skill to put on your CV and one thing I've done as we've gone on in the courses any new thing that I've learned I've just added it to my CV because I think it just ticks another box when you're applying for jobs or PhDs or anything. Um, it's so organised. Yeah. No I, I, I really I really emphasise what Eddie just said though um, so many jobs in this kind of area both on the energy side and the ECMM side um, they needed to understand how EIAs work whether you're doing them yourself or whether you're commissioning somebody, you need to understand how they work. And they need you to have some knowledge of GIS. So being able to put both of these things on the CV is really important. And I should mention also, it's not all about voles. Um, I think this year there was an option between two different projects, wasn't there? 
Yeah, there was a wind turbine project as well, um, but I didn't cover that because I'm ECMM. Uh, but one thing that we did do as well, we did quite a lot of workshops and guest lectures, and they said how important it was to try and get involved with um, voluntary projects and corporations and things, not only for experience, but future employment as well, which was quite quite valuable. The SAIEM website is a really good one to look at. I've used this module in the past to get students to challenge developments and we actually stopped uh, a salmon farm in Galway Bay because the students did some really good critiques of the IA which I then passed on to the, the guys that were opposing it uh, and that was, that's been the highlight of my career in the last five years absolutely and it was students that did it they, it was there they dug into the AIA and said you know this is this is rubbish you're talking rubbish here you know and it was rubbish uh, very proud of that I didn't know about that Moving on, uh, invasion biology. So I'm going to need your help here as well. So this is one where I, I would take this out of the programme, but students absolutely love it. Uh, and and it's, it is one of the big five, you know, one of the major issues that is facing the world is, is this ecological change that can be caused by, I mean, there's three species here that are, are having a, a, incredible impacts. You know, lionfish is having impacts, not just in the Caribbean now, but it's also been found in the Mediterranean. Uh, and it's not supposed to be there and it doesn't have any predators there so it's a, it's a real problem the killer amphipod uh, which is is about that size um uh, is is invading our rivers you know and it shouldn't be there and of course the gray squirrel um, the tree rat uh, is bringing disease and killing off the very beautiful red squirrel that should be that should be here um and these things once they're here they don't go away again that's it once an invasive species is here the, the impact might not be immediately obvious but it's never going to go away uh, anything you can add to that Sorry. i think um i i do think it's an important module to be fair in in disagreement with you uh, magna uh, because <laughs> i feel like it's becoming more and more of an important topic and it is incorporated into i think it interlinks really well with the other modules especially ecosystems assessment it's actually a section within a lot of the tender projects and things we've been doing um, I think it's quite a good skill to have. Again, we've had lots of guest lectures and we've done lots of little modules where it's actually given you certificates, which again, you can add to your CV on identification skills and better biosecurity, which I think are really all valuable skills that you can just add to your portfolio. I think they're quite a key attraction if you can say that you can go out and identify different things. I just know that every year the module evaluations on this module are, are phenomenal. Uh, yeah, so Laurie obviously did a really good job. Yeah. I should mention this one is only for ECMM students, um, as is the next one, ecosystem assessment. So this one is, you could call this, you can almost call this freshwater, it's a very boring picture for this one, I should change that. Um, you, can, you can almost call this freshwater biology in, in some ways, you know, it's a lot based on rivers. Um, the guy that leads it, Bernd, is an expert on um, environmental DNA, so I think he talks about that quite a lot as well, but it's about, you know, sampling freshwater. Um, he's He was one of the most militant staff in terms of trying to get people out in the field. Uh, he was absolutely... <laughs> he was it's absolutely... Like the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow forest being stuck in for COVID. It was great. Uh, yeah, but he honestly, he gave management such a hard time he was so determined that students were going to get get out and get into the field and get some hands-on experience because he felt like that was really important so he works usually this module is run in conjunction with some people from the Hull International Fisheries Institute and these are practitioners these are people that work uh, in freshwater biology for a living and also a good source if that's an area you're interested in uh, heading towards for your um, project you know, uh, it's another institution. It's it's like EEI. You know, it's another institution. It's full of experts in a particular area, uh, and and the hi-fi survives on what they call soft money. So they're contractors. You know, um, and so it's, they have a slightly different way of, of tackling academic problems. You've got to get the job done. You know, uh, is there anything there, Ellie? To add? Well, for me, this module um, was really good hands-on experience. I I don't know if anybody else agrees, but I learned better through practically doing it and, and physically being able to see how things work and I think to be able to actually get out in the field and say yes I've been part of a river habitat survey or a phase one habitat survey things like that are invaluable and also out in the field they send an expert so we had Andy Dunn with us for the river assessment and they're just great to tap into their knowledge and, and ask questions and you know physically see things that you wouldn't necessarily see just looking at um, a lecture or anything. <laughs> Sorry. 
That's right. So we all got used to it now. Kids on kids on Zoom uh, or Teams. Yeah. Oh yeah, we, yeah, we have uh, occasional cats popping into lectures at present. <laughs> <clears throat> so that's all the modules. Um, so to recap, in the first semester, we have two shared modules: the research issues, which is all the group presentations, environmental and energy data literacy, and then either principles of renewable energy or environmental change in the Anthropocene. Trimester two is a bit more split. We have the one shared module on EIA and GIS, and then uh, either the two renewable energy modules or the two ECMM ones. And that brings us to the dissertation. Do you want to say a few words about that, Magnus? Yeah, I mean, this is this is a capstone, really, of, of your MSc. This is a thing that makes it. You get a whole summer to work with an academic on a topic that they are interested in and that you're interested in. and um, you know, you, you might spend the whole summer in the lab, you might spend it in the field, you might do a combination of both, you'll get access to, um, you know, like if you were working with me, it would be on fisheries and I would give you access to local fishing organisations and even get you out on a boat working with um, a local, on a local research vessel. Or there's a seaweed farm in Scarborough, for example, that's keen to take master students on. We, I, I'm really keen that students get experience, it, as is Simon, it, that that we get students experience in industry um so they they get a chance to sort of learn a little bit about more than just doing stuff um behind a desk or or, or in a university environment quite often people cross the floor on this module so you'll get students who are renewable energy and they'll they'll come across to ecmm and you get students who are doing ecmm that having had to listen to all this stuff from renewable energy students for a year will will actually go across uh, uh, you know, and do a project there. So you can do an in, interdisciplinary project there. I mean, environmental science by its very nature is interdisciplinary. And, and you know, I, I love it for that. I love the fact that it's it's got all these different inputs from people in different, different places. And, you know, well, the EEI, I mean, how many people have you got doing different topics in that institute, Simon? Oh, we're up to nearly 100 now. Dan might have the, uh, have the figure. Um, we've got a wide range of people, not on energy, of course, but a wide range of people across EEI, biology and geography, which is where we pull most, but not all of our dissertation supervisors from. Uh, we've got a really wide range of expertise. This year, we've got a couple of projects also being supervised by the business school where people wanted to get into uh, supply chain issues around um, sustainable supply chain. So that kind of thing could work as well. Um, so give, give an example of what I'm supervising this year. Um, I've got one guy uh, looking at tidal energy resource in the Humber Estuary. And I've got two students who are working with uh, Siemens, um, looking at how they would design a renewable energy grid for an island that's not connected to the national grid. And they're going to be helping Siemens with a little bit of that project. And then um, there's the interdisciplinary one with Rodney about squeeze on space. Is yeah. that one of yours this year? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's one of mine as well. Um, so working between me and Rodney from biology, and we're looking at um, in a hypothetical future where we have, uh, well, we've, we're planning at present 40 gigawatts of offshore wind in the North Sea. By 2050, that might be 100 gigawatts just in the UK sector, add in the Danes, the Germans, the Dutch. What proportion of the North Sea is going to be covered in wind farms? And what, where might they be? What sort of plausible layout for them? And then what proportion of the sea is that covering? And what space that leave for other users how is that going to affect fishing how is that going to affect ships going through and shipping lanes and so forth so that's very interdisciplinary as you said okay um we should probably briefly talk about covid i guess um and how things are going to work next year and the answer is we don't really know um because <laughs> nor does anyone else um last year we had to adapt a lot very quickly and we moved almost entirely online um, but rather than just doing online lectures, which is really difficult for everybody, we moved to what we call blended learning, where we produce um, a lot of the, the content along the lines of you need to know about these things. We've tended to produce as recordings and as things to read, little snippets of 10 or 15 minutes at a time that people can read at, in their own time in a given week when it's convenient for them. And then we normally get we've been getting together uh, online live to have a discussion about it or do something else uh, relating to that. And that's worked quite well. And uh, some students have certainly said that it works much better for them than having to concentrate through traditional lectures. Um, in the coming year, the idea is we're going to keep a similar kind of format where a lot of the simple information transfer is 
done asynchronously, so on your own schedule. But the hope is, of course, that all the uh, discussion sessions and all the, all the live sessions will be in person rather than online, as long as regulations at the time permit. Uh, and of course, we're waiting to hear, we're, we're waiting as much as you are to see what happens on that. But that's very much the hope. And the hope, of course, is that we'll be back to doing practicals and field trips as we normally would. Um, again, subject to how things go. Yeah, Anything I mean, the problem with field trips is, is, uh, is the transport funnily enough once we're there it's, it's generally fine but um, wind farms are generally windy that's not dangerous it's getting <laughs> on fast yeah. <laughs> well, i mean we're taking a bundle of students to spurn uh in mid-june you've got an invite to that sam if you want to come where we're we're relaying fifty thousand oysters um uh, and you know it's it's getting them there that's the issue once once we're there it's it's going to be absolutely fine they're going to stay in tents uh, they're going to camp out overnight so it's going to be great fun <laughs> Right, we need to move on time-wise, I guess. Um, last bit of this is quite briefly, at this point, you're really enthusiastic, you really want to study renewable energy or ECMM, but why do you want to do it here? Um, partly because the fabulous course, partly because you want to be taught by Magnus and you're prepared to put up with me. Um, <laughs> didn't need to see that. <laughs> the Humber Estuary is known sometimes as the energy estuary. And the reason for that is that 24% of all the UK's energy passes through here. And that's not all renewable. Uh, some of it is offshore wind. Some of it is because we have oil refineries here. We have gas pipelines coming ashore here. Um, but the scale of the offshore wind build out really is quite incredible. Um, this picture on the right is about a year out of date now, but it's showing uh, all uh, uh, as of about a year ago, all of the existing and planned wind farms in the North Sea. Um, and if you look at the kind of trapezium shaped one of London, um, that's the London Array. And I was, I was slightly involved in building it back in 2012. And at the time it was the world's largest wind farm. Now, if you look at the top right, you've got the dark blue, the light blue, the white, the gray, that's the Hornsey development. The dark blue is Hornsey one that's, uh, that's there. The, the next one is Hornsey two. These are now, when they're built, going to be the largest wind farms in the world. And some of the ones just off the top of this picture will be even bigger. And all of this Hornsey development and quite a lot of the other ones in this picture are being built out of the Humber. Um, we've got Siemens Gamesa, who are one of the major, probably, probably at present the dominant offshore wind turbine manufacturers, have one of their factories in Hull. They make their blades here and they assemble their turbines before they go out to sea. Um, Orsted, who own and operate a, I don't know the proportion, but a large proportion of the North Sea offshore wind, uh, they have their main uh, maintenance base in Grimsby, just across the estuary. Um, we usually go to visit them at some point during the year. And of course, those are the big hitters, and they've got a supply chain built around them. Um, so there are lots and lots of smaller companies supporting them. And some of them come to talk to us in guest lectures. Perhaps more importantly, they're all potential employers in the area. Um, on top of that, we have Aura. Um, you see the logo down at the bottom, which is a university initiative to connect with those companies and to develop innovation around offshore wind. So if you're particularly interested in offshore wind in particular, then there's a lot of help available there in getting in touch with people. Um, within the university, there's also a lot of uh, expertise around biofuels, around energy from waste, hydrogen. Um, there's a whole other story there about uh, the fact that the hum Humber area is the UK's most polluting industrial cluster in terms of carbon dioxide. We produce a very large proportion of the UK's CO2. And there's a whole um, exercise there about how do we decarbonize all that heavy industry. And that work's going on here, uh, probably involving hydrogen production and carbon capture and storage and so forth. So you can learn about that as well. Um, even the university itself, uh, we are targeting a net zero campus by 2027. And I believe that is still the most ambitious of any UK university. Uh, Dan will probably correct me in a minute if I'm wrong on that. It certainly was last year. Um, and at the present, we're looking into the university building its own solar farm to supply uh, much of its campus's needs. Uh, and I now have a slide called The Ecology of the Humber and Yorkshire Coast, which I'm not going to talk about. Yeah, so I'm just going to zip through this really quickly because I can see there's lots of questions uh, coming, good questions as well. Um, so it's a the Humber Estuary is fascinating. Uh, you're, it's Humber Estuary and it's Yorkshire. Um, and uh, there's, there's 
so many opportunities along this coast to do stuff. And, and one of the things that um, I think I, I bring to this particular course is I, I'm part time, so I'm 0.8 academic, and I'm not 0.2 uh, as a marine consultant. And I have an office in Scarborough, uh, and we we have a boat. Um, and I I only started this last year, but I, and COVID got in the way. But the, one of the reasons for doing this is I want to give students the opportunity to get involved in marine consultancy research stuff uh, with me. Um, but you can see that there are a couple of projects uh, that are illustrated here. One is we have um, native oysters that are being um, planted uh, in the Humber Estuary on Spurn Point. And like I said earlier, we've got a load of students coming out in June, uh, master's students coming in June to come and help uh, relay uh, 50,000 oysters and take some sediment cores and look at carbon storage in the in the Humber estuary. Um, I'm very involved with local fishing organizations, well nationally with fishing organizations, I've got really good links with with them uh, from the National Federation of Fisheries organizations, the Scottish organizations and the very local um, Bridlington Holders Fishing Industry in, Industry Group. Um, the, we, when we put this oyster farm in place, well, just to illustrate a point, when we put this oyster farm in place, we had to jump through about a million hoops because this, this estuary is so protected in so many ways. It's a major bird migration route, and it's, at certain times of year, you can't move for twitchers, uh, bird watchers uh, hanging around in Kilnsey and on Spurn Point. And there are so many protections on it for good reason because it's it's a seagrass area, it's Spartina, it's a you know it's an incredibly rich estuary in terms of bird life and informal stuff in sand. I could go on and on and on, but we've got eight minutes left and you've got lots of questions. So I'll, sh I'll, sh I'll shut up. Fair enough. One last thing to very quickly mention for renewable energy only, we do have some £5,000 scholarships available. Um, you'll see the web link for the course in a second. It's all detailed on there. Do have a look. Do be aware if you want to apply for those, the deadline is the end of July. It is an earlier deadline than applying for the course itself. There's a summary. Uh, I'm not going to read it out. You can read it. But most importantly, those are the web links at the bottom. Uh, and you'll be able to find this on YouTube if you need to refer back to them. Uh, so if there's anything we don't manage to answer in the questions, we will try and get back to you in any case. But do have a look at those websites and you'll find also our contact details there if you need to follow up. Uh, OK, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Maria, apparently we have some good questions. You do, you do. So we haven't got a great deal of time, so I'll, I'll go through those. So Savesh has asked about which modules do you have exams for in the MSc Renewable Energy course? And also, what will, how will students be assessed throughout the course? OK, we forgot to mention this. Um, there are no exams on this programme, on either of them, I think. Uh, so it's all coursework. Um, the form of the coursework varies. On some of the modules, it's fairly traditional essays or more often, less often essays, more often commercial style reports like you might, might produce in industry, which means you get practice at writing those. But in some modules, it can be quite different. Uh, the research issues one in particular is all about group presentations. Great. Thank you, Simon. And one from Magnus now. So Timothy has an offer for the ECMM course. And he's asking, what are his options then if he wants to go on to do a PhD? Um, best advice there, work really hard, get a distinction, get something published from your uh, project, which is entirely possible, and make yourself marketable. Um, there, there is a project Aura. I'm not, I'm not sure when the next Aura funding uh, stream comes around. Is there another one next year? It, it's, uh, it will finish only for the CDT. Sorry, uh, yeah. you talk about yeah, well, I, yeah. I don't know. Sorry. Yeah. So there, there, are very, there occasionally there are um, PhD, groups of PhDs that are offered clusters of PhDs that are offering various topics. But you know, it's it's uh, competitive out there. You've got to work as hard as you can to get on these programs. You know? um, or a CDT is particularly relevant if you're interested in offshore wind, and not just from the engineering perspective. It covers covers environmental aspects too. Um, I think it normally starts recruiting. Uh, late in the year in sort of September, October, November for the following September. Um, but there's often, depending on how many applicants you get, there's sometimes more than one round of recruitment. Thank you. So Joy has asked a question. So she's, she has a BSc in microbiology. She's currently working in an environmental consulting firm and lab analysing wastewater and soil samples and she's actually wants to know Magnus what the re research prospects are for her in ECMM. Um, 
so well it's the best thing to do is to have a look uh, on the website and uh, see what what there is in terms of um, staff expertise uh, the, when we cross over into human health as well so that the, there's I'm, I'm trying to think who does microbiology probably uh, Prof Rochelle does ecotoxicology, which might be close to the sort of thing you would be interested in. And I know Ellie's doing her ma master's dissertation uh, with uh, Jeanette Prof Rochelle. So, um, and that, that's quite exciting. So that's quite exciting. That's quite a decent sized lab, a lot of postdocs and things there, a variety of projects. You haven't started yet though, have you, Ellie? No. <laughs> yeah. Um, we've, we've got a question about funding opportunities, but I think you've answered most of that, Simon, with the grant that's available. Unless there's anything more anyone, either of you want to say. Mentioning also that postgraduate loans are a thing, and I don't know any detail about that, but I, don't, I know there is some information on the university website. Um, We're internationalists and international students, so I would uh, suggest that they contact the international office, international at hull.ac.uk, and they have details on a variety of different, fun it's hard though, it's hard, I mean, it's really hard at the moment, um, getting funding. Yeah, international definitely, as Magnus says. Also worth noting for anyone else uh, wondering about it, that there is a uh, scholarship or a discount, I think of a thousand pounds off the fees, if you do the undergraduate at Hull. Thank you. And are there any specific requirements uh, for admission for international students? This particular um, attendee is from Africa, but any in general, but it's worth noting now. Uh, There's a requirement on English qualification. I don't remember the details, but that will definitely be on the website. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, it's I guess it's for every, it depends where, which country you're coming from, doesn't it? So best thing to do is write and ask and we'll try and help. Yeah. Ask us or ask the international team. Okay. Um, also, any prerequisite skills that people could be thinking about now? Statistics. <laughs> <laughs> Get, have a look From at R side, and have a play with it. Yeah. Sorry, Angus. From my side, not so much about skills, but more about um, if you're enthusiastic about the topic, start reading um, and yes. start getting current yeah. on what's going on. And yeah. The thing about a master's course always is the more you put into it, the more you get out of it. And if you're on top of things and really interested and proactive, and if you're on the top of what's happening in the country and worldwide, then you'll be able to relate what we talk about in, in the, the um, course to that, and you get much more out of it that way. Great. So we've had a question about internship opportunities and a separate one about placement opportunities. So could you address those, please? Well, I think we talked about that a little bit. So both Simon and I are very keen to get students doing their projects with industry, uh, and we have different links uh, related to our particular topics. But and sometimes students find their own, uh, and we will happy to facilitate that. Yeah, I, I would say that um, the the main thing is via dissertation projects. And um, as I say, this year we've got I think three or four. So it it is a minority. Um, certainly on the renewable energy side that we will that we've arranged that we've arranged in advance and we will offer. Um, sometimes a student has a connection with a company, or sometimes a student just writes to a company and gets in touch with them. And if they're able to build that link, we're really keen to support that. Uh, and also, if their student has a particular target company, we might be able to help out, maybe via Aura, we might be able to um, help arrange things there. But I think if it's not if it's one of the, if it's not one of the ones that we've actually arranged and offered, then it's going to be up to the student to drive it and say, I really want to work with this company. And then we're happy to help however we can towards that. Wonderful. Um, at the risk, Ellie, of making things difficult for you now, you've got two children in the room. Um, <laughs> somebody's asked about the student, a, a glimpse of the student experience. I know you, you've given us a really good idea of what it's like to be a student. Is there any sort of quick tip you want to give or any sort of highlight you want to to offer? General or at Hull, sorry, I missed that first bit. Um, I think probably at Hull the, uh, and, and doing the, the, court, the course as well. It's been really different for us obviously because a lot has been you based from home when you're speaking yeah, to people through a computer. One really good thing which yeah. Magnus did at the very beginning was um, put us all in a big group together. I think the, the working together on the um, presentations really helps so you get to know each other, get to talk to each other. But we've also, We've also, on top of Magnus doing the WhatsApp group, so we all get to know each other, we've formed our own little groups and we all meet up regularly, socially distanced, obviously. Um, and just to talk to each other. 
Sorry, always, whenever you have a cookie, I always go crazy. Have you got um, any more ice cream? <laughs> no, <but I'm> <laughs> the bride to keep them quiet <laughs> um yeah so we all kind of support each other and um, we have meetings on teams you know if you're stuck with anything in particular or if someone finds something that might help the rest of the group we all kind of support each other so that's what i love about the whole theme it's quite um and it's an open door policy as well so you can always just drop one of your lecturers a message and they respond within 24 hours if, if you're really stuck so yeah hope that helps yeah, that was really handy. Well done, Ellie. It's been a for years, isn't it? Hard to comment on. I'd actually um, have, just to expand on something Ellie said there, something I always make a point of really emphasising at the start of the year is on I think of both of these programmes, we have people from a really wide range of different backgrounds. So everyone's got different experiences to contribute. And if, if one person doesn't know something, the chances are somebody else will. Frantic nodding. Yeah. Um, yeah. Music teacher this year, philosopher, philosopher. We've got a music teacher, a philosopher. Yeah. Uh, Ellie's got a previous uh, degree in marine, but you've not been doing that for. You ran a, a bar or hairdressers for a few yeah. years or something. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> businesswoman. Let's call you a businesswoman. Uh, Did you share the video that the uh, musician made about your Magnus? That's. <laughs> I, know. I need to see this now. You do. <laughs> It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to fail his masters, I'm telling you. It's awful. It's very good. It's very good. Very funny. Um, somebody, uh, Timothy, has asked about uh, in ECMM if he can take a course in renewable energy. So I've, I've kind of so you talked about the shared modules. Is there anything more to say in answer to that? I think. The, the, I mean, like we've described, there are modules that you do that are shared that have bits of elements of both. Especially that first one, that that the the I can't remember the name. The one with a really long name. It's an absolutely brilliant module. It's a and and it has that mix. But then there's the projects, you know, and you can decide after you've finished. If you do ECMM and you get to the end, you decide renewable energy is where you see your future. You can do a third of your project on renewable energy. You know, and there, like Simon has described really well, you know, there are lots of opportunities within that industry, and they're not all—it's not engineers building wind farms. It's you know, it's it's all everything else that goes with it. You know. Um, what about opportunities to work on sort of green building sites, is that greenfield sites, um, after the MSC and renewable energy? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, there's a lot of activity in that area uh, and in fact um, I think Dan's probably nodding because we've got a project at present working with Hull City Council um, instrumenting one of their houses to um, allow them to, uh, to figure out how to make their social housing much more energy efficient. Um, I would put slight caution um, that if your particular interest is on the building end of things on the kind of downstream end um, you, we do cover some of that and we'd love to have you but our, our, our bigger focus on the renewable energy course is about the generation, is about big wind farms and things. So we'd love to have you, but if you know for certain now that you really want to be dealing with stuff in buildings, this might not be the best course. Thank yeah. you, Simon. Good comment. Um, somebody, Joy, has asked about um, field trips and sampling and how they'll be handled um, under COVID restrictions. If, if we can do them, they will happen. Uh, as long as we can make them, I mean, it's not us uh, that make the decision. Really, it's it's about national legislation and university interpretation of that. But I, I mean, I live for field trips. <laughs> uh, that's what we do. We take students to um, Malaysia, Egypt, Indonesia, Tobago, all, all over the world in the undergraduate degree, and you know, and postgraduates. We want to get you out there doing stuff with your hands. You know, that's that's what it's all about. Getting dirty. Um, somebody's asked about deadlines so could you just run through some deadlines for applications the, the question is about is around resum resumption but um, I don't know if that's application uh, don't, that doesn't mean anything to me yeah. if you apply before the start of the course uh, and you've got the qualifications you'll get on as far as I'm aware the only thing that might cause you issues if you're not from the UK do it sooner rather than later because uh, who who knows what's happening with visas at the moment so um you know it's all doable but the, the time it's taking to get get through that process is longer than than we would like ideally so apply apply sooner rather than later 
I just add to that if you're applying to renewable energy and you might want to be considered for that five thousand pound scholarship that's due by the end of july thank you Dan, yeah. Can I also just add on, um, we, we, this year we've had um, lots and lots of interest in, in, in the matters, more than any year previous. Um, so, so the only caution side, side of that would be, um, if we get flooded with applications, then we might need to be a bit more selective. Um, we hope not to have to get to that point, and we'd hope to kind of bring anybody on who applied the months to come. But, but the, you know, the sooner people apply, the, 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 the more secure we'll know in terms of our planning what we need to resolve it all. And um, if we get to September and all of a sudden we, we receive a, a wave of applications, um, we won't be able to resolve them, the, um, the, the course properly. And rather than taking people on and, and not being able to deliver a, a good program, we would prefer to turn people away and, and say, you know, this is how many uh, folks we can teach and teach effectively. Um, and, and we need to be a bit more selective around that um, as a result. So, so just so, yeah, if you, if you think you can, don't leave it to the last minute and um, get, get your applications in um, earlier on. And that helps us in terms of effectively for people to join. Thank you. Um, just a couple more questions. So somebody's asking about accreditation. So are these two programmes accredited? And if so, who buy? Uh, renewable energy, not at present. We are looking at it for the future. Yeah, same. I, I mean, I would like to see uh, our marine biology degree is, is accredited. Our undergraduate degree is accredited. And uh, I'd like to follow that same route. Um, and I would probably be the same route for renewable energy as IEEM. Um, there's there's a whole load of different organisations, and we're looking at which ones might be the most appropriate. Yeah, it is uh, a good but, point. But for the purposes of the, this coming year, we're not currently accredited. But Dan has a hand up. Yeah, you, you just um, that, 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 that's right. And of course, you know, further down the track, um, that that can be important in terms of um, uh, in terms of chartership and, and, and getting kind of different accreditations as you move through a broader career. Um, if the uh, course that you're on um, is subsequently um, uh, uh, accredited after you've done it, then the there's this kind of um, onward propagation of, that, of those accredited, uh, accredited programs. And so, so if we if we do go and get accredited um, in, the, in the next year or so, then, then that would that would happen. And um, I guess the, the only thing the, the, the reason the reason it's not a simple thing to do is there's three things to balance off. And um, the first one is is a, is a cost associated with, with accreditation. And then what you've got to balance out with is is the value that it provides to the course. Um, uh, and then finally uh, uh, alongside that is then thinking through well what restrictions on the program does that accreditation result in? Because some accredited Program, most accredited programs have a set of stipulations around the, the things that you have to teach. And that does is constrain a program perhaps in ways that doesn't really fit with what you want to teach as an organization. Um, and, and so, in many ways, um, I value much more the kind of input of, of, of partners and stakeholders and, and, and end users that we work with over the time rather than a, a, an accrediting body. Because um, that accrediting body often has a specific kind of criteria and set and look that they want their, their accreditation to sit around. Whereas we're trying to sort of a, a, a broader, more diverse way of, of stakeholders and, and ultimately create uh, trajectories than, than perhaps in terms of accreditation would limit it to you too. So, so yeah, there's a set of things we need to balance up. The uh, moment the sign says um, we're, we're not accredited, but um, we, we are looking at it, but, but um, there are things for us to balance up and do so. I think just to add to that, you can accredit yourself. So, for example, I'm a marine biologist. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a fellow of the Marine Biological Association, um, and that wasn't part of my degree. It's something I applied for afterwards, and you start off as a member. There's the same with uh, IEM. There's the Biological Ecological Society. There's there's a variety, and that would mean that I think one of the if if we decided that everybody on ECMM could was accredited as a marine biologist. That wouldn't help if you didn't want to be a marine biologist. So the, the options to accredit yourself, having got the masters, which will have the stuff in it to get you some level of accreditation in most um, uh, recognized organizations, is, is probably a better way to go in, in some ways. That gives you the freedom. Our courses are really broad. You know, um, we're, we're not sort of a, a focused thing. We're not sort of like building society or something like, like a, 
you know, uh, construction degree or something. It's, it's they're really broad degrees, but within them, there's enough for you to get accredited by various organisations, and we can help you with that. Yeah. Great, thank you. I think the last two sort of outstanding questions. One is around how many semesters. That's three in either course. And the other is about how can I get the presentation. So we will be um, following up with an email to everybody with a link to the recording of this webinar, which includes the presentation. So look out for that early next week. And I think that's the end of our questions. So I'll hand back to you guys to, 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 to finish off. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you to all the people who asked questions. Um, and hopefully other people have found those answers useful as well. We also have, Maria, we also have some videos um, about the courses, but I guess we can put those in the emails, can't we? We'll put those in the emails as well, yeah. Can we say thank you to Ellie and her little helpers as well? <laughs> Excellent helpers. Um, yeah, and thank you to everyone who's come. And I hope this has been interesting. I hope this has been maybe fun as well. Um, and I hope to see lots of fantastic applications and see some of you in September.